Welcome to um, my session, um, Expelli Analysis. I think I probably should start by um, explaining why I called it Expelli Analysis. Um, well, at the time when CWNP asked for um, a name for a title for my talk for this conference, my um, middle child, which is my youngest son, was um, just reading Harry Potter and was running around the house saying, um, Expelliarmus, um, several times. And for those of you who have um, read Harry Potter or have seen the books of Harry Potter, Expelliarmus is a magic spell which they use to remove an object out of someone's hand, normally a wand. Um, so I thought, why not call my talk um, Expelli Analysis? Um, because what I'm going to talk about is how to remove problems from the hand of your network. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about. And I also thought it was a general enough title that it gave me a while to come up with a talk. So it was a win-win situation. Okay. Um, my name is Peter McKenzie. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at McKenzie Wi-Fi. I've got a bunch of Wi-Fi certifications, co-authored a study guide. I'm also a Wi-Fi wizard as some of you might know. So there's my hat. Um, let's get into what we're talking about. Now some people, if you've heard me talk about protocol analysis before, I have very often used an analogy between magic and analysis. And the analogy basically goes that if you use a protocol analyzer correctly, it can be a bit like a magic wand for a magician. I end up spending probably 50% of my time training, 50% of my time doing consultancy. And of the consultancy I do, a big majority is troubleshooting and um, wireless analysis. And when people phone me up, they don't tend to phone me up the day they get a problem with their network. They go, hey, we've got a problem, let's phone Peter McKenzie up and we'll get him in to fix it. They obviously try to fix it themselves first. Um, and by the time they've found me, they've maybe had a problem sometimes a month, two months, it can be six months, it can even be up to a year, that they've had this issue and not been able to fix. Then I go in, I spend a day capturing packets, doing the analysis and tell them what's wrong with their network. And it, I appear like some sort of magician um, to these customers. And I guess... When you've done magic, and if you do magic a lot, there's one question that magicians often get asked. There's one question which people always want to ask, and that is, how did you do that? And it's that people want to know, they ask the question because they want to know the secret. They want to know what's the method behind the trick. How did you manage to fool us? So, I was thinking about that. What's, a lot of people also say the same things with analysis. They'll go, oh, we wish we could analyze packets like you. How do you do it? What's the secret? So I thought quite a long time about this, and I thought, actually, it's quite an easy secret. So I thought I'd share it with you today. It's very simple to say, and it's know your protocol. It is the essential part of protocol analysis is to learn and spend time learning protocol. You can, you can learn a protocol analyzer tool, whether you use Wireshark, OmniPeak, Air Magnet, it doesn't really matter. Tools are fairly, you can sit and watch videos online, you can go on courses to learn how to use a tool. Um, but if you capture packets and you don't understand how to interpret them, you don't understand what you've seen in the analyzer, it's a pointless tool. And the secret being able to be a successful an analyst is to actually know protocol and to learn it. Now, learning protocol is not easy. You have to spend time. You have to put effort in. You have to, you know, spend a lot. You want to be studying for your CWAP if you've not got it. And you need to spend time reading standards, reading RFCs, learning what's normal. And a lot of people say, well, it's difficult. And my answer is it is. 
Um, as a magician, if you ever learn a sleight of hand, you have to put many, many hours of practice in, sometimes months of practice. I know when I was learning how to um, cut a deck of cards with one hand, do a one-handed cut, I spent days learning that, days of, with a deck of cards in my hand, dropping them on the floor, picking them up, dropping them on the floor again, picking them up, throwing them across the room because I got frustrated. Um, but it takes hours and hours of practice to perform sleight of hands, to perform any sort of magic trick. It's exactly the same with protocol analysis. If you want to be good at it, you need to put the time and effort into learning protocol. Um, when I started out doing protocol analysis, I used to capture packets everywhere I went. That was effectively how I learned. When I'm sat in an airport waiting for a flight, take the laptop out, start capturing some packets. When you're in a hotel room, capture packets. When you're at home, when you're at work, when you're at a conference, how many people have captured the packets in this room? I wonder. Um, there's Wi-Fi everywhere, which means there's opportunities to learn everywhere. We can get, it's very easy to get an analyzer out, capture some packets, have a look at them. Do we understand them? Pick one particular conversation. Do we know what's going on? And when you start doing that, you're going to say, I don't understand what this is. But then as you start to answer those questions, that's when you start to actually learn how to do protocol analysis. So some people will say to me, OK, you, you like your protocol, Peter. You're passionate about it. We get the idea. It's hard. It's difficult. But do we really need to do it? Isn't packet analysis dead? Really? Still, still going on about packets? Nowadays, when we've got network management systems, we've got AI systems, we've heard about some of those today, can these systems not just do that work for us? Can they not do all, they can analyze the packets? I don't really need to know. I would much rather spend my time drinking coffee, maybe. But, and well, I guess my answer to that is that I think AI and I think network management systems are really valuable. I think they can do an awful, provide an awful lot of information to us. Um, and, but they don't do the whole job. And I think when you're trying to solve problems, there's three important questions. There's what is the issue, what's happened, what is the issue, what are users experiencing? You need to identify what the problem is, even identify that you have a problem. There's understanding when did it occur? Did it coincide with any of our events? And then understanding why it's happening. Now, I think when you look at network management systems, you look at artificial intelligence systems, they're very good at answering the what question. What happened? What's gone wrong? They're quite good at answering the when it happened. Well, it occurred when we upgraded the APs, or it occurred when um, we changed something in the configuration. They can also answer what I would class as the initial why. Um, and, but, only, but the problem with just answering what I would class as the initial why question is it doesn't necessarily give you the full answer or help you to remove a problem for your, from your network. Um, I, I don't know if any of you um, have children. Um, I'm sure many of you do. And children love the why question. I know um, my children, you often end up having conversations, something like, it's like, can you stop doing that? Why? Because you'll fall and hurt yourself. Why? Because of, you know, what goes up must come down. Why? Because there's Newton's universal law of gravitation. Why? Well, because every particle attracts every other particle in the universe with a force which is, you know, um, directly relational to the sum or the product of their masses and inversely um, proportional to the square of the distance between their centers. Thanks, Dad. Why didn't you say so in the first place? Um, but, but kids love to 
They're, they're really inquisitive. They love to, there's not just one why question. There's often, you can give an answer, but they want to know more detail. They want to know why something is a, why does it work like this? How does it work? And they always want to know more and more why questions. And I think we've got to do the same thing with analysis. We need to often ask multiple why questions if we really want to remove a problem from our network and not just wallpaper over the cracks in the network. We can very easily paper over problems, but if we want to actually remove them, we need to be able to answer not just one why question, but several why questions. So let me give um, a quick few examples. One of the times I was um, troubleshooting a problem in a, um, I'd been called up by a, a company in the UK who had its distribution center, and they had an issue in their freezers. And in their freezers, they, um, they were big walk-in freezers, and the colleagues who were working there were having problems printing labels. At the end of the day, they picked certain items, and then they had to print a label from a printer, a while they had a um, fixed printer, but these wireless guns. And um, they realized through the, um, exactly when, so that was the problem, that was the problem, they were having troubles wirelessly printing. The, they knew the answer to the when question, when did it occur? Well, it occurred when they turned on some external APs in their wireless LAN system. They turned on these external APs and they, they had problems internally in the freezer section, wirelessly printing. So, you could say, why do they have a problem? Well, they've got a problem because they've turned on some external APs. Sounds a bit odd, that. Why is that? Um, and what they then did was they turned off the external APs because they didn't understand the why question, they just turned them off because that'll fix the problem, won't it? The problem is that didn't fix the problem. So then, with a little bit more investigation, um, and when I was sat there talking it through with them, I said, well, what did you do to turn on these APs? Oh, well, they were newer APs and they needed newer code version, so we updated the firmware. So they then realized that, oh, maybe what changed was updating the firmware on the, on the Wi-Fi controller. Um, and as it turns out, when they backed off to the old firmware, the problem went away. Problem solved. The problem is we don't know why upgrading the firmware caused a problem with wirelessly printing. What does that mean for the long-term future of the network? Do we never apply any more upgrades? And then you leave the systems out of date. You leave the systems with an old firmware one, potentially open to security bugs. Because we can answer that why question. We know the thing that caused the problem was upgrading to the latest firmware, but we don't really know why. And you talk to the vendor and they're like, well, it works in every other environment. So it's a unique issue with the firmware in their environment. Um, and I think this is um, a common recurring theme you see. I was doing some um, a wireless design for a pharmaceutical company, and as I walked around their facilities, I noticed many um, machines that were still running Windows XP. They were running um, really old versions of Windows 7. They were not patched up to date. They were out, there was lots and lots of unpatched, out-of-date software. And, when I, and I mentioned it to them in my report. It wasn't why I was there. I was there to look at the wireless and do a new wireless design for them. And I just got told, oh, well, we don't like um, patching computers or updating them because we're worried that if we do that, the software might stop working on them because that's been our experience in the past. Um, and ultimately, that was a case of, They've had problems in the past. They've not been able to understand why, so they just don't update anymore. Well, about two months later, that same company was hit with some ransomware because they weren't patched, and it, they lost 80% of all their data, and it cost the companies literally millions um, in lost revenue. So let's not leave problems um, in our networks. Um, so I'm just gonna go through another quick example I want to talk through with you guys. Um, this is um, some 
troubleshooting consultancy I did fairly recently, within the last year. And it was a supermarket um, chain in the UK, and they had these self-shop um, barcode scanners, which the customers could take with them as they go around and do their shopping, and they can scan the items as they shop, and it saves, stores everything that they brought on their gun. And then when they get to the point of sale tills, they guns download all the shopping to the till, and they can just pay for it and leave. So that was a system, and it had been working for um, many months. And then they decided to upgrade and change the security on the Wi-Fi system from TKIP to CCMP. They went from WPA to WPA2. And these devices stopped working. What the actual problem was, when they got to the terminals, they just couldn't download the shopping. Um, they, didn't, they just sat there waiting for ages, saying they were downloading and nothing happened. So all the devices that they used were capable of CCMP. They were all 802.11, they were capable, these particular devices were 802.11n um, scanners. They supported CCMP, so why were they not working? Um, so we know the what, we know when it happened. It happened when they moved from TKIP to CCMP, but do we know why? Well, the initial why question, they had someone from the handheld vendor to go in and do some troubleshooting, and they'd come up with, we're getting a high retry count. Okay, so that might have something to do with it, but still, why is it not downloading the data? We need to ask several why questions. Why are we getting retries when we've, all we've done is really change the security mechanism and now we're getting more retries when we didn't? It doesn't make a lot of sense. And so, and I think it's scenarios like this where protocol analysis becomes really important. So let's look through um, a little bit what I saw. Here is a screenshot. It is showing um, the protocol capture of this problem I did. Um, believe it or not, there's everything on that screen you need to know, need to troubleshoot and identify what the problem is. Um, but we'll talk through it um, a little bit before we go into um, the detail of it. And what you will see there is you'll see lots of um, encrypted data frames and lots of acknowledgements. Um, we can see that the encrypted data frames are going to the self-shop client. That time was monitoring, they, that's the one in red. And there was, um, and then the client was sending an acknowledgement back to the AP. But if we look closely at the flags column, in the flags, you'll see there's a little plus next to every encrypted data frame. That's telling me it's a retransmission. So what we're seeing is from the AP data, the client's sending an ACK, and then the AP is retransmitting the data. Then we get an ACK, then we get a retransmission of the data. ACK, retransmission of the data, ACK, data, ACK. And this was consistent for the entire, all of these clients. The AP couldn't send them any data. Every time it tried to send data, we, when it was trying to download a shopping, we ended up getting, um, we, we saw ACKs, and then the AP seemed to ignore the ACK and retransmit the data. Now, when we looked at the client sending data to the AP, we got data, ACK, no problems. So it was only in one direction we were having these problems. So you could initially go, well, obviously, the client can hear the AP, but the AP can't hear the client because it's sending an ACK and it's ignoring it. So it must be a power issue. But if you look at the signal strength on that trace file and we were near the client, we can see the AP fairly strong. And don't forget this worked when it was TKIP. Nothing's changed in power levels. And we also know that when the AP sends a data frame, the AP acknowledges it. So we've got a little bit of an unusual situation here. Um, the other thing that struck me was if the AP doesn't hear packets from the client, how is it associated to the AP? So we scrolled back up the trace file and we look at when the client associates and we can see there's 
some probe requests, probe responses, there's some auth packets, reassociation requests, response, four-way key exchange, all being acknowledged, all working absolutely fine with the client in the same location it is when it's uh, sending data and we end up with problems. So what is the issue with this trace file? Well, it seems to be fairly obvious, doesn't it? The AP isn't, is ignoring the acts and retransmitting the data. Let's, it's obviously a bug with the AP. Let's raise a support case with the vendor of these APs and get them to fix their APs. You could take that as a logical conclusion, but this is why it's important to know your protocol because if you know your protocol, there's more to it than that. And we've got to look at what we can see in the analyzer and identify what else is wrong about its trace file. What is wrong that we see inside here? And the trick, key, to identifying what the actual issue was and where it was going wrong is actually the data rate column, which is why I've displayed it. What you'll notice from the data rate column is the encrypted data is going at 6.5 megabits per second. 6.5 megabits per second is what type of data rate? Anybody knows, is it like a, it's a HT data rate, isn't it? It's, a, it's not an A or G data rate, it's, a, it's, a, it's MCS zero. Now, remember that this problem started when they moved from TKIP to CCMP. And what do we know about TKIP? TKIP can only use OFDM data race. It can only use data race up to 54 meg. We cannot use HD data race. So one thing that struck out to me was one thing that's going to be different is the presence of using um, HD data race. But 6.5 meg, why can't the AP send data at that rate? Absolutely fine. But look at the acknowledgments as well. The client seems to match the data rate that the AP sends in its acknowledgments. When we looked at its initial association, they were going at 6 meg, the client would act at 6 meg. Now it's the data is going at 6.5, the client is acknowledging at 6.5. So is that a problem? Well, it depends how well you know your protocol. And it depends how well you know our acknowledgements allowed to be transmitted at 6.5 megabits per second. Let's have a look at the standard. This is um, apart from the 802.11 standard, which dictates what rules, um, the rules which are allowed to, for sending control frames. And it's all about when can you send control, at what data rates can you send control frames? Can you send them in a HT PPDU or a very high throughput PPDU? And it's a little bit small print, so I'll blow up the important bit. But there's basically, it says the following determines control frames is carried in a non-HT, a HT or a very high throughput PPDU. And there's A to F. And A to F, all talk about very particular situations when you can either send a control frame in a HT PPDU or a very high throughput PPDU. Most of that list are conditions on which for features which have never been implemented. In fact, A to F in most normal wireless lens are never going to be true, which leads us to the very last clause Otherwise, if none of these other conditions are true, which they weren't in this case and, and in most cases, the control frame shall be carried in a non-HT PPDU, and then it talks about some requirements for further specifying when HT or very high throughput PPDUs can be transmitted. And the acknowledgement as a control frame should never have been transmitted 
in a HCPPDU, meaning it should have never been transmitted at 6.5 megabits per second. So if we go back to looking at our trace file from earlier, is the AP right to ignore an acknowledgement in these conditions at 6.5? Yes, because the client should never have been transmitting. So we've just turned from blaming the AP now to identifying it's actually a client problem. But you're never going to get there unless you understand protocol and you understand what data race um, different frames can go at. It's so important to spend that time learning, otherwise you're going to look at a trace file and go, yeah, it's probably the AP. And you're going to raise a case. Whereas it wasn't, it was actually the client. So um, just to complete the story, we then, I then chatted to the client um, uh, vendor. Um, there was actually a guy from the client vendor on site while I was doing its troubleshooting, and they um, ended up coming out with a fix for this issue, a new driver. And they said, yep, we've updated the driver and we've fixed the issue. So I was like, okay, great. Let's implement it. Great, they can now download their data, but I want to see what you've done. Because you should always validate that um, the behavior has now changed. So that's exactly what we did. Um, I took another protocol capture, and the data the, it now looked like this. We could see day to act, no retransmissions. We could see, if you look in the size column, things are going well. We've got big amounts of data being transmitted. If we look in the data rate column, it's now just using non-HT data race for acknowledgements, but also for the data. Well, why is it now just using non-HT data race for the data as well? We need it to use it for the ACK. Yes, Jess. Yeah. Let's have a look at the um, probe request from the client. Here's the probe request from that particular client. It still had a HT capabilities information element, but if you look at the um, MCS race it supports and the spatial streams, it was nothing. So the way they fixed the issue was just by disabling all HT data race. There was obviously an inherent problem with the chipset that they just couldn't fix. Um, to be honest though, I accepted that as a fix because the scanners don't actually need a high data rate. And one of the main reasons for moving to um, a sort of HT, um, moving to CCMP, um, was so that other devices could still use HT data race. So it was a bit of a compromise, um, but I, I, and although it, I found it quite funny looking at the probe request, um, it, was, it did sort of work in this scenario. Um, but that was a much better fix than the initial fix that was being told when I first pointed out the issue was before we fully understood the why, was, oh, we'll just go back to TKIP which could have been an answer, couldn't it? We've gone from TKIP to CCMP. It doesn't work. We'll just go back to TKIP. But doing that, because we don't, the only why question we've answered is, why did it happen? It happened because we upgraded to CCMP. But then you leave your entire network running on lower data rates, running on less security, and you're not actually removing a problem from your network. You're just almost creating more, potentially, in the future your paper in over the cracks. So it's important that we know our protocol so that we can properly troubleshoot. Um, and as we learn our protocol, what it helps us to do is correctly interpret trace files and correctly interpret data. I've got one more example before I finish up here. This was a very busy area of environment where they were struggling to get data um, through. They, they were having various issues, and I, I wanted to identify whether they were having problems with retransmissions or not. So, um, as you might get in network management systems, you often get these graphs shown you today which show retry rate, and here is the retry rate graph for that network. Um, and we can see it's less than 10%. So, conclusion is not a problem with retries in its network. Um, and this is 
That was the sort of conclusion. If you, we look at that graph, we'd say 10% of free tries, that's normal for Wi-Fi, we're happy with that. And we, we probably all, probably many of you today, look at sort of network management systems, look at retry statistics, and you have a particular percentage you're happy with. But uh, we've got to know our protocol to know how to interpret that percentage. What does it actually mean? Well, when we look at it compared to our total data, we can see that, yep, a very small amount, only 10% of all packets transmitted on the network are retries. So that's what it's actually telling me. But is that a realistic value that's actually meaningful? Well, let's have a look at the protocols on that network. We can see that 90% of all um, protocol of all protocols was beacon frames, and then a further 5% were probe requests, and it's only then the third most popular protocol was encrypted data frames at 2.1%. What do we know about beacons and probe request frames? They're broadcast frames. Are broadcast frames acknowledged? Will a broadcast frame ever be retransmitted? No. So if all, most of my traffic is broadcast, is it really a true reflection to say, actually my retries were less than 10%? So we need to look at it a little bit different. Just looking at total packets of retries isn't very interesting. What happens if we add our data packets as a line? Now, it's very hard to see because it's just a green line that I've just added to that graph, hidden amongst the retries. So if we get rid of turtle packets and up the scale a bit, again, we can see that an awful lot of my actual data packets were actually retransmissions. So this is what our graph looked like when we were looking at all packets on the network. We had a very low retry count. If I show you what just, if we select just the encrypted data packets and look at the retry graph, this is what it looks like. Often peaking up to 100% retries. This was a network that had serious problems but in pushing data because it was getting, a, it was a very noisy, high CCI environment with lots of retries. But just looking at the initial statistics, my makers go, actually there's no problems here. So it's important that we understand protocol and we have deep knowledge of Wi-Fi so when we're given these graphs, we're given these high-level statistics, we know how to interpret them correctly because knowing how to interpret them correctly helps us to identify really what's going on. I believe our industry needs more experts. I think management systems, flow-based systems, AI systems are great and they're providing a lot of use. But the problem is, when we rely on those systems, what ends up happening is we're de-skilling engineers and the ordinary, ordinary sort of network engineer doesn't need to touch an analyzer in his day-to-day -day work, just maintaining and analyzing a network. But what happens when those systems don't tell them what the issue is? Maybe 60% of the time they're telling them where issues are and they're being able to fix them. But what about the times when they don't? That's when they need people who actually understand protocols, who understand, who can go in and actually fix the issues for them. I was at a particular vendor's um, technical training um, a few months back and um, there was an SE giving the training for it and they said, yeah, what's really unique about our product is we look at wireless performance from the client perspective. And he was showing some statistics and he said, you see these? See, that's showing the signal strength that the, how the client sees the AP and therefore we can do really clever analytics on it. And I went, I'm sure that's the signal strength that your AP sees the clients. He probably didn't like having me in his class, but he went, no, 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 it's the signal strength that the client sees the network at. And I was like, oh, right, how do you get that information? Do you have an agent on the clients? And I said, no, he said, signal clients report the signal strength to CDAP and in every single packet they transmit. 
I said, I, I can guarantee you that they do not do that. I said, that information is not in every Wi-Fi packet. They, receivers tell you at what signal strength they hear a packet, but not what they transmit it at. Um, to which he looked a little bit sheepish and said, well, 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 that's just what I've been told. I'll have to go and ask some questions. But his whole presentation, or a big chunk of it, was based upon the fact that they do things different to every other vendor in the industry because they look at things from the client perspective and the statistics they're giving you are as the client sees the network. It wasn't true. And we need people who are skilled enough to be able to not only know how to interpret these graphs and these charts correctly, but we also need to be able to, I, I'm thinking as an industry, we're getting more marketing focus and more marketing led, and everything's becoming much more higher level. And we need to be able to be discerning as to what is true and what is wrong. So I really believe we need to, as an industry, we need experts in our field. We need people who are willing to sit there and invest their time and energy into learning how it really works. Um, you know, taking CWAP is a great first step, and I'm really pleased that many of the students who sat my course this week have passed, so congratulations to them. Um, but it's only a start taking a CWAP exam. That should be the kickstart people need to start capturing packets, start learning how Wi-Fi works, um, spend your time doing analysis, because it's really needed in our industry that we understand how this technology works so that we can, uh, you know, identify and interpret the systems we've got correctly. So I'm going to leave you with a quote from Albert Einstein, who says, when you stop learning, you start dying. Keep learning your protocol. Thank you very much. <laughs>